Fifteen centuries ago, these images of the Buddha were carved from the solid rock of Ceylon. The kings and the commoners who worshipped here have long since passed away, but they would still recognize much of the land they knew. Unchanged are the lush green valleys of the lowlands, and the jungle waits, ever ready to reclaim its own. In the low country, the farmer still follows his patient oxen, turning the rich soil of the paddy fields for the next sowing of rice. And in the cool highlands, the tea crop is gathered amid tranquil beauty that seems far from the noise and bustle of our modern age. Down on the coast, the fishermen too prepare for their harvest, mending their nets as did their ancestors before them. They are tough, weather-beaten men, and their life is a hard one. Though the seas that lap the island are rich in fish, they can never be sure if all their efforts will end in success, or failure, or even in disaster. At the end of the day, the outrigger canoes of the fishing fleet come swiftly home before the evening breeze, bearing their catch to the market. This is a sight the world will not see much longer. For even here, motor power is replacing sail, making the lives of the fisher folk less picturesque but far easier. Their day's work done, the boats lie drawn up on the deserted beach beyond the reach of the waves, waiting to sail again before another dawn. But beneath the seas of Ceylon is a magic kingdom that its ancient rulers never knew. Not until our generation could men enter it in freedom and safety. Therefore, it is for us of modern Ceylon to be your guides in this new world. So come with us beneath the foam and surf, where the Indian Ocean roars against the reef. We're traveling now into a submarine empire, where no man has ever dived before. The sunlight slanting through the surface gleams on the silver underwater camera that Rodney Jonkless carries. He swims in a fantastic fairyland, as weird as the face of the moon. The surf is forever carving these rocks into shapes as baffling as any produced by a modern sculptor. Fish swoop and wheel like birds in the hurly-burly of broken water. As we head for deeper and calmer water, a fleet of batfish sails above us.
Inquisitive and unafraid, like most animals that have never seen man, a school of mullet dives to look us over. Beyond them, a large grouper glides away into the distance. Below us, a rare and beautiful triggerfish, one of the butterflies of the reef, lures us deeper, but keeps his distance. And now the reef becomes a labyrinth of grottos and caves through which the current races. We wind our way into valleys and along the sides of submarine cliffs. Above us, the light is dimmed as a wave roars overhead, like a cloud across the face of the sun. The strength of the current increases and we dive down, down to escape it. The bubbles from our aqua lungs go tinkling towards the sun and a drowned cave looms before us. Shafts of sunlight piercing through holes in the roof gleam on the white sand as Rodney pauses to collect a rare seashell. Now the cave ends on the weather edge of the reef, facing the open sea. Here we find the largest congregation of fish, for this is where the currents bring the food. And here the hunters and the hunted gather under a temporary flag of truce. We join the crowd and are quickly accepted as a member of the community. We are honored, although we must often push our new friends aside to take pictures of other creatures, like this turtle, hurrying past on some private business. We have come bearing gifts. Rodney's little blue bag contains portions of freshly caught fish. And the big groupers waste no time in accepting our invitation to dinner. In the hope of getting a close-up, we place a piece of fish on top of the underwater camera. But the plan succeeds better than we had intended. And we nearly lose the camera. 
The faint trace of blood from the bait drifting down the current now builds an invisible road along the reef. Following that road comes a hungry shark. As the last piece of fish is swallowed by our friendly groupers, the invisible road dissolves and the disappointed shark turns for the open sea. Completely unaware of the visitor, Rodney continues his business, only a few feet away. The tameness of the groupers encourages us to further experiment, and so we shift to a section of the reef where the water is shallower. Here, with the afternoon sun dappling his body, we find Sinbad basking outside his cave. Now, for the first time, we break our strictest rule. A fish is shot and the truce is broken. It is necessary if we are to study the reaction of Sinbad to a wounded fish. The reactions are not slow in coming. One hundred pounds of powerful fish can provide a rough ride. And Rodney's in no little danger from Sinbad's demonstration of brute force. Buried deep in the 15-pound jack which Sinbad is trying to swallow is a needle-sharp barb of tempered steel. Sinbad's mouth is hurt and he gives up the struggle. After all this effort, he has learned that brute force is of no use. So when Rodney offers him the fish once more, he takes it gently, very gently. Now we cannot doubt his intelligence. And if further proof is needed, see how his small companion Alibaba points out that he too is hungry. He nudges the underwater gun and then sits back to await his turn. Now we plan another intelligence test. Rodney, as well as being a marine biologist, was for many years a deputy director of Colombo's world-famous zoo. He has trained elephants there and now decides that groupers should present no problems. But first we must kill again and the once friendly fish now avoid us. Rodney is forced to enter the reef to shoot a fish as a reward for his pupils. The first move is to show both Sinbad and Alibaba that they will be fed if they pass through the hula hoop. Sinbad, perhaps remembering the harpoon tip that hurt his mouth, stays in his cave, while Alibaba takes the lesson. Perhaps the red hoop looks like a huge mouth, for Alibaba will not cooperate by passing through it. But hunger overcomes caution. Sinbad, watching from his cave, sees Alibaba get the reward for passing through the hoop. Now for the first time, come to a bullfight beneath the seas of Ceylon.
last, completely relaxed, Sinbad our bull awaits the will of the matador. Rodney seems to be in complete control. But is he? Alibaba joins Sinbad, and together they prove who is really the master. We are now on the flat meadows of the reef, and as Rodney ties some bait to the top of the rock, he looks around, for this is shark territory. The blood from the bait fish has once again built the invisible road. Before long, another traveler appears, a small shark about six feet long, quartering backwards and forwards like a bloodhound. He approaches the rock and begins a stately dance, backwards and forwards, round and round, while his sensitive smell tells him that he's within inches of his prey. Why can't he see it? He bumps his nose once, twice on the rock, just below the fish. Ah, the fish moves in the current and the white scales flash. Now the shark attacks fiercely and tearing the bait from the rock disappears into the blue. We follow our now established procedure and shoot a fish in the presence of a shark. Can it be trained like our grouper? Rodney offers the fish to the shark. Once again the dance begins, round and round. But now the shark knows where the fish is. He can smell it and he can see it. The shark becomes more agitated and picks up speed. It twists in its own length and the situation begins to look serious for Rodney. As the shark becomes bolder, we begin to hear a series of weird noises, high-pitched squeaks and whistles, and we realize that the shark must have heard them long before us. A school of porpoise is approaching, and the shark is torn between its fear and its hunger. The whistles increase, and like the US cavalry, the porpoises arrive in the nick of time. We will not repeat the experiment. Next time, there may be no porpoises. And so, our journey together ends. We have returned, though briefly, to the seas that gave us birth. As we head back to the air and the sun, we feel honored to be living in this, the greatest age of exploration that man has ever known.